It's only episode five of the golf. Let's wrap it up. So, loads to talk about. We've, um, it's been a little while since, uh, since the last one, because like I said from early on, my uh, the whole game of this was to um, was to see if these if these amps were any good if they could live through a sort of daily environment and still be sounding tip top for you know to compete with the standard stuff that we use or you know the, the other sort of higher end stuff that we use and um, yeah so I've got plenty to cover on that which I'll cover you know I'll, I'll cover shortly but here's the boot I don't believe other than in the last episode where we sort of teased the, the boot. I don't believe we've done an episode on this. This took a little while, the floor. It's a multi-stage floor with a triangular design, which, you know, was led from the badges, really. So the amplifiers, the 606 is facing the other way. I always wanted that to happen because I wanted the cables just to run straight into the car. The other two are facing this way in their sort of standard format and their looms go off and around, as you've seen in my uh, wiring episode, which I think was episode three. Haven't had to, well, I've had to lift this floor once since we built it because one of my kids pulled the USB cable out. You know, I don't know, probably think it's some sort of iPad charger or, or something. But um, yeah, other than that, there, there's been no need. There's been no need to get to the amps at all. There's been absolutely no issues with them. Of course, once they're wired in correctly, where everything is is pretty much software based. You know, there's no knobs to twiddle with. They're all digital. So, yeah. This has been spot on. It's not 100% finished. I think Stuart had a plan to put a light in this area where this white channel is. This is white because the car's white and the Alcantara here is like a silver white, the same as the car being um, silver gray. So um, yeah, there'll, there'll be a light in there at some point, but I actually quite like it. And I, I don't have much need really to keep it on display. This car doesn't really get shown or anything. It just gets demonstrated for the way that it sounds. So that, that can kind of wait most of the time i have my oem floor this was all designed with the oem floor in mind if you can see these these mounting points um because i run a, a passive 10w6 as the subwoofer for this system and i like it in a box so that i can take it out put whatever i like in the car or i can swap it out i'm constantly swapping subwoofers so things that you might not see like this internal scallop shape here it's all sort of dipped in and ridged down none of this is none of this is sort of flat 2d panel work it's all three-dimensional so there's just some nice cues there for for sort of pro installers and and the more sort of advanced sort of fabricators amongst you that look at it and wonder why it looks the way that it does it's all just these simple little cues these little kicks and bends and everything being sort of perfectly at the same angle um lovely absolutely my type of install this completely hidden away by the OEM boot floor. Hey. So yeah, away we go. And it's tucked in, just like that. Sub box goes on there, and we listen. And boy do we listen. These amps sound rad. Let's have a look around. around the front since the last time we spoke you haven't seen this um, and we didn't actually shoot this I don't think but we have installed the C7 mid bases in the doors the doors are fully deadened you know inner outer skin we took the inner skin off everything like that as full on as you can get it really in the door without interfering with the door itself my long-term plan is to remove this grill to kick that speaker around and to rebuild the grill somehow, but we don't get, you know, as you can appreciate, we don't get tons of time with our own cars. So um, we kind of had to get them mid-base in there as well as we could. To be fair, the factory mid-base were doing an all right job with that much power behind them because we wired them into the system just to get some mid-base off the ground. Again, another time constraint while we did the mid-range and tweeters, but um, they're in there now and you know, you think you've got it all right until you put a proper mid base in, you know, and I've done it countless times, but that that sort of power and speed and openness it as well in the crossover point that a good quality mid base can give you, 
it's ridiculous. So I'm kind of second guessing now as to whether I should modify this at all. You know, we have a mid base stage above the dash. We have some nice separation there. I don't think that we're going to have many issues with this mid base. Yeah, all right, it's going to get better with a better location and a more on axis position, but do we want to spend that amount of time? Do we want to cut the door card apart? Because that's another thing. I need a sacrificial door guard to do that job or a pair, you know. So, um, you never know, there might be an episode six. <laughs> um, yeah, so C7 mid bases are in there. They're on a baffle, we've deadened the baffle, dampened, dampened it down as much as possible. We haven't gone crazy with the baffle. It's not like a super aluminium braced monster of a bracket. It's just a standard door baffle for the Mark 7 that we've damped down. Again, probably due to the fact that we had a couple of days, we didn't have a couple of weeks to get the mid bases in there. But they work really well. Um, really good mid base, that strong, fast. The, the, you'll hear that a lot throughout this. The whole JL sound to me is a uh, fast and accurate sound. It's a little bit more robotic than say an Italian product, which is a little bit more sort of warm and natural sounding, a little bit more beautiful, you know? Whereas this is a bit more attacking and hard and fast. Yeah, it's just got that sort of balls to it, you know? You've seen the mid-range and tweeters, let me... These are fairing perfectly well, and they work really well indeed. So they've been, I mean, it must be... It's got to be a few months now since the last time we shot this car. It's just intentional, you know, it needed to... The parts needed to live in the car and be... be proven reliable and proven good, you know. You can be blinded by some products, you know, pretty new shiny things. But, um, yeah, they're working really well. I obviously haven't opted for the um, spotty mid-range grill. I've gone for the standard grill, because that's just a, a bit of me, that is. And uh, these sit there, and most people that see them agree that they're not um, they are not invasive at all. They're just, yeah, some people have even mistakenly thought that they're just, a, a you know, an OEM add-on. Obviously, I don't think that, but as minimal as they can possibly be and to get away for, you know, to get away from the way they look, to get that sort of sound stage is just, yeah, really good. I'm really happy with that. Um, we had a bit of a bass knob disaster today or well over the weekend i had a a, a bike part in here I, I can't even remember what it was but i dropped it and it hit the very tip of the base knob and smashed it straight back through the hole that it was in so jamie's had all of this uh sent a console out today to uh rectify that for me and he has he's replastic welded uh that product in because it just has to be nice and solid you know when you're we call it knob feel you know Good old knob feel. Um, drawback. It's going to be a drawback, you know. Like I've said, I'll be as honest as I can with this product. There's a couple of things. One, it makes like a heartbeat when you turn it on. Boom, 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 boom. Actually, let me see if I can get that on camera. Okay, so it didn't do it. Which, I don't know if it's a part of the car or if it's a part of the system. It didn't do it before, but it sounds intentional. Sounds like, um, you know, when you get into some BMWs and they do that. Whoa. Sounds a bit like that, but it's boom, 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 boom. It just happens twice and then that's it. I actually quite like it, but it wasn't there before and it is there now. And I don't know if it's an intentional thing. The other thing, which is a bit of a biggie for me, is, um, you see my DAP? Okay, as you'll know from... The previous episodes I have a fiber optic cable in here because I have a fiber optic output on my DAP so whilst I would print a mount so that it could sit in there like that I would still have to have a fiber optic cable now of course with any DAP based system or any secondary source with a DAP you have to have um, a digital input and you have to have a way of controlling that digital input now Maybe this is my fault, but I assumed an amplifier with a fiber optic input, an analog input, blah de blah, 
uh, an auxiliary input would have some form of source selection, some form of SPDIF in, master in, augs in, whichever input, and that that would be controllable via the uh, JL, the DRC, so the, the remote control knob, whether it went through the box, uh, the, the VXI hub, or whether it went each directly into the VXI and then passed its signal via the Toslink output on the amplifier to the inputs on the next amplifier, and then we deal with any latency in the software, um, I just stupidly assumed that... Well, not stupidly. It's not really stupid to assume that. I just assumed that that would work and I would be able to switch it with a press of the DRC and control the master volume with the DRC. It's a very simple thing to miss, in my opinion. Now... There, are, there is a workaround, okay? There is a workaround, so you can make it have fiber optic input, but each time you want to source switch, so say from your master input from the car's radio to your DAP, you have to go into the software and you have to um, basically re-channel the software and when you're using three amplifiers like this you'd have to re-channel each one to tell it that its main input is sp diff and then it'll work well that's all good and well and maybe i wouldn't mind doing that because it's rare that i would use my dap anyway but if we were to sell a product to a client and sell them what we call a switcher so like basically a preamp dsp that has source inputs we couldn't do that we couldn't allow that to go out and have them sitting on their driveway with their iPad with the jail tune software changing the inputs of all their amplifiers so they can get SPDIF on the input so that's probably my main bugbear with the whole system um, not too much of a concern to me because my OEM source unit is actually a really good unit the the this generation of VAG had a just a just basically a nice output does not sound bad at all so i have minimal need for my dap maybe i'm tormenting myself leaving it in the car and i should take it out it's winding me up more than it should but uh yeah anyway so you can't switch with them i'm not really interested in hearing that you can if you go into the software and change it all of the input settings i know that i can do that and that would make pretty much any product a switcher it's a switcher if it has a control where you can control two different input sources. You can have them both at the same time and you can switch between the two. You know, I don't mean you can have them both at the same time playing, of course. I mean that you can have both sources ready to go and you can switch between the two with a remote control. So you can't do that. Um, yeah, sound. Okay, right. I'm going to have to set this camera down because uh, it's heavy. Actual sound, so off the bat, great, I knew we were going to have a good time. With, with certain systems, you can tell if you're going to have issues, you can tell immediately, you know, you, you don't need a setup DSP to understand if you've got phase problems, your, your brain will tell you that the second you turn it on, you know. And it wasn't like that, you know, because we've done it countless times before, the signal was all fine, polaris were all correct, everything was nice, it's just that all of our crossovers were relatively wide open until we'd set some safe parameters, and I knew we were going to have a good time, you know, and we have. I mean, it's probably had probably five or six hours worth of tuning, just because it's mine, so I will stop when I get home or sometimes I'll stop on the way home and just do certain tweaks because I tune for the road I don't tune for car parks I don't tune for sitting in here in the perfect silent environment I tune for the road so if you hear one of our cars in a car park I mean you should try and hear it it'll be thick you know the mid base will be a bit thick the sub will be a bit thick you know uh, because it's set up for the road it has to sound good on the road I don't want a kick drum being masked by the motorway you know so um yeah i'll i will stop on my way home or when i get home to tune ever so slight little things and i don't sit down for two hours at a time and tune i don't really believe in huge tuning sessions there is that initial establishment of your ins and outs and getting everything kind of squared away so it sounds good on that initial setup with new kit that takes a little bit more time but let's say 45 minutes to an hour in some cases 
but from then on I'll try and keep it to 10 minute sessions because the last thing you need is to be listening to something and it getting better and better and better and it's just your ears playing tricks on you you know you go to it the next day and you think what the hell was I doing I was just drunk on my own sound you know so um, yeah it's had many many little little things I've just done some today actually I just pulled a little bit of well, I, I dropped about 0.5 dB on the whole right hand side, just a shift of sl stage ever so slightly, you know. Um, it was just, yeah, I just noticed on a long drive, we were at Wembley over the weekend, I went to watch Blur, uh, which was incredible. Um, I just noticed over that long drive, it was just ever so slightly heavier on the right hand side. But most people are, probably wouldn't care less, but you know, it's, yeah, it's just one of those things. It sounds fantastic. The I wasn't looking forward to the class D nature of it. I wasn't looking forward to any tricky new software and it just being all much of a muchness. That's how I went into this. And it just isn't like that. You know, the software's just just great and simple once you, or intuitive once you get to use it, you know. They, they don't sound anything like your typical class D amplifier. There's no flatness to it. There's no sort of, lack of soul to it or energy, you know? Well, no, energy's the wrong word. Class D usually carries a, a fair bit of energy. But yeah, that sort of realness that you that you miss from sort of class A, B amps and class A amps, it's not lacking in this. So the R&D that JL do, which they're, they're, they're known for, they're known for spending a long time doing something and then leaving a line in the market for a long time, which is just brilliant. I love it when products are in the line for, 10, 20 years, they're sort of known for it. They've done a good job with that. So um, yeah, great off the bat. And then after setup, you know, it's just an absolute joy to listen to, especially with things like uh, things like rock, things like metal, um, fun stuff and hip hop, you know, with plenty of sort of bass and attack and energy. Just absolute pleasure to listen to. It's just one of those systems where you kind of want to just go out for a drive. So. Yeah, I can um, I can get behind it. I can get behind the product. They're in a strange place in the industry at the moment with their distribution in question in the UK and things like that. It's not being managed too well, but I don't think it's jail's problem. I think it's just the sort of UK market and the way it is. So, you know, if you're noticing things out of stock and things like that, just speak to us first and we can let you know when things are due in. I'm pretty sure we're over the hill now with that. So, yeah, we should start seeing stock again soon. But um, yeah, cracking product. I'm glad they approached us. I'm glad we've got the experience of that product. And uh, we're probably gonna use it a little bit more, you know, in its use case. Most of our systems do require a switching input from, you know, either from a DAP or from a secondary source, in which case we can't use the VXI product. But we will be using it when we have, you know, especially systems like this when there's only a single source and we're going to get that source to sound as good as it possibly can. So anyway, rambling on, good product, safe buy, tricky initially to set up. You've got to make sure you get the right product. You can't just go buy an any VX amp and expect it to do anything. You need to make sure you get, get the right system together. Yeah, and the, the C7s, I haven't even spoke about the C7s, either, the mid-range. The tweeter looks like it, just looks like a, a generic sort of, I don't know, 22 mil tweeter. It's not, but it just looks like one. But the sound that comes out of it's ridiculous. You know, it's a fantastic tweeter. Mid-range is lovely, it looks lovely for a start, which is nice because it's in front of you all the time. But it sounds wicked as well, you know? And I was a little worried about the, the, the sort of plastic, the ABS in the enclosure. I know we've got a thick wall, but it can ring, you know? Um, and it doesn't, it seems to be damped well enough by the pillar and then it's open into the pillar as well. So it's effectively IP. So there's plenty of sort of depth from the mid range there. So yeah, so if you want to listen to it, you know, it's here all the time. It's my daily car. So it's, it's often in a bit of a mess, but never more than say it is today. I've only taken a couple of things out of it to show you, but um, you're more than welcome to listen to it. And if you're considering the VXI product and the C7 product and you're watching this video to sort of get that purchase over the line, buy it from us and we'll look after you. All right, I'm Carl, this is Studio In Car. It's probably not the last you're gonna hear of the Mark 7.5R, but um, in case it is, 
you take it easy and I hope you've enjoyed all the episodes. If you haven't seen the other ones, there's loads of them. Go and have a look at them. All right.